I had the pleasure this year of serving on the Robert Phillips Award Committee, and it's truly a labor of love because we get to read all the nominations and hear what our colleagues are doing in their communities in our region. The, each year, the Northwest Public Employees Diversity Conference solicits nominations from our sponsoring jurisdictions to honor an employee, a work group, a team, or a department that has demonstrated a sustained commitment to diversity that goes beyond their day-to-day -day job requirements. This award is named after Mr. Robert Phillips, the founder of this conference, and it embraces the spirit by which he poured out so much for the cause of creating a more inclusive, diverse, and equitable workplace and region. To all those who wrote a nomination this year, we thank you for recognizing the work of your colleagues. And to all the nominees, we thank you for your contributions and the outstanding work you've accomplished. We'd like to honor you by reading your names. Please hold your applause until the end. Courtney Von Shake from Home Forward, Hakim Singji from the City of Portland, the Implicit Bias Instructors Group from the Training Division of the Portland Police Bureau, Janine Smith from Washington County, C. Bondurant from Multnomah County, Casey Layton from Multnomah County, the Employees of Color Resource Group from Multnomah County, Eva Aguilar and Thomas Eggleston from Washington County, and Dora Perry from the City of Portland. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Robert Phillips, who's worked in the area of equal employment opportunity for over 25 years and has a long history of involvement in the civil rights field. As director of Multnomah County's Affirmative Action Office, Robert was responsible for the development of policy initiatives, plans, and programs that promote respectful work environments for diverse employees and assisted the organization in meeting its equal employment opportunity and affirmative action obligations. Robert served as a commissioner of the Port of Portland Civil Service Commission, and his community service includes appointments to Nike's Corporation's Minority Affairs Advisory Board, gubernatorial appointments to the State Commission on Black Affairs, and service on the Oregon State Bar Affirmative Action Committee. Robert was a recipient of the 2009 Arthur Fleming Award by the Multnomah County Managers of Color, among many others. In 2012, the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaimed February 28th as Robert Phillips Appreciation Day. Now in retirement from Multnomah County, Robert has an encore career during which he serves as a member of the Oregon Assembly for Black Affairs Political Convention Planning Committee and the Northwest Renal Patients Advisory Board and the Port of Portland Fire Department Civil Service Board. Please put your hands together for Ms. Robert Phillips. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here once again to present the Robert Phillips Award. I know there's a number of recipients from past awards presidents I'd like to ask them to stand for a moment so they can be recognized and I can recognize their presence. Yeah. Today, I am reminded more than ever that these are the precious moments. Our calling is not to take them for granted, but to accept life as it is and to do whatever good that we can for the promotion of humanity. And the reason I said that is because my roommate was supposed to be here with me. He's kind of like a caretaker. And over the past weekend, he had a double stroke. And he's lying in the hospital. And before coming here, I spent time with him, holding his hands and putting oil in his hair and just letting him know how valuable he is to all of us. 
These are the precious moments. Let us not take any of them for granted. Life comes and life goes, and what is left is the goodwill we share and leave behind. On this 25th anniversary before giving out the Robert Phillips Award, I wanted to recognize someone who has given so much to keeping this conference going over the years, bringing it to this 25th point in time. And that person is Percy Williams, Winters, Jr. Let's give him a hand. I have two things for you. One of them is a picture, and on it it says, one person, one person can make a difference. A single, clear voice carried far and achieves much. Sometimes there aren't any tempers, just lots of dragons. Convictions and endurance are the winds at the back of great events. So I'd like to present this to you. And I said there was two things. <laughs> and I also would like to present you, it kind of gets messy a little bit, but with the President Barack Obama's Leadership Award. And it says, Barack Obama, we did not come here to fear the future. We came here to shape it. To Percy Winters Jr., year 2018, Diversity Leadership Award. Now, at this time, it's the time to present my award. <laughs> this person uh, just overjoyed in learning, had been selected for this award because I watched her work over time. And she's been a strong-willed woman, dedicated to service to others, extending herself from her family all the way into the community. One of the things, and I was not going to say it, but I'm going to say it, <laughs> that touched me one time was I'm connected with her husband on Facebook. And he put in there, I love my wife. And I found that to be special and touching because it said a lot about who she was as a person, her giving to family, loving her children, building everyone she come in contact up. I never seen a situation where she was involved in something and she didn't just put out herself into others, making their life experience of value. The precious moment. Sherelle Jackson has a long history of leading in place championing equity and diversity initiative as a senior leader in her branch of human services, which is Multnomah County Developmental Disability Services. In addition to her professional advocacy over the past two years, Sherelle found and implemented an inspiring nonprofit venture for teenage girls. Why I Rock, 
cool, cool concept, cool name. <laughs> Why Rock, which in the last year brought together nearly 100 inner city girls of color ages 10 through 15. The conference is the first to boost a celebration of historical and current women of color leaders from Portland. It is the first that specifically focus on young black African American girls. The two day long Wire Rock Girls Conference exposes participants to college opportunity and role models. They attend classes on a college campus in a university classroom taught by experts in the field of professional professors, doctors, lawyers, principals, public health experts, and corporate executives. As Sherelle likes to brag, all the experts look just like them. Working with Building Blocks to Success, Sherelle was chief fundraiser, soliciting funds from various philanthropist organizations from a host of different donors so that all participants could attend free of charge. Let's give her a hand for that. She organized the venture for the conference and tapped her considerable social capital in the city of Portland to bring together an outstanding roster of local leaders. Most importantly, she had the vision, the drive, and the grit to make this inspiring and transformational event happen. And that's saying a lot for anyone who can put in the time, the energy, not only to conceptualize something, but to really make it happen. She has contributed to the precious moment, which is contributing to the life of our people in our society to make a real difference. At this time, I'd like to get the Robert Phillips Award so that I can present it to this year's recipient, Sherelle Jackson. didn't mean to cry. This is just so personal for me, so thank you. Thank you so much for this very prestigious honor. I want to thank my Lord and Savior for this opportunity and give him glory for instilling in me a desire to love on his people, people who are vulnerable, without a voice, oppressed, and are unable to speak up and stand for themselves. I'm grateful to my department director for her belief in me the work I do, and the commitment I have to equity which inspired her to nominate me. The Northwest Public Employees Diversity Conference Committee who selected me, my mom, <laughs> who raised me to be God-fearing and taught me what it means to love others, and who also taught me the power of using your voice, but also cautioned me the tongue is powerful, but it's also a weapon. Be careful with it. My husband, who shows me daily what it means to love unconditionally, and of course, my Why I Rock conference team, an amazing group of women who said yes despite details when the conference was simply a random idea to support young girls of color. I thought long and hard about how to use this platform because it's not every day that one has a platform like this to promote a message about equity and social justice, to champion equity and to unapologetically stand boldly against the injustice of racism and disproportionate treatment. 
and yet here I am. I'm being celebrated for work I've done as a leader in Multnomah County and as a champion for young girls who look like me. And while I'm extremely grateful, I also feel a bit guilty because as much as I want to say it's because it's the right thing to do, which it is, I also know I have so many selfish reasons for doing it. I was called the N-word in seventh grade by a white peer. I had never heard that word before and didn't know what it meant, but the derision in which he said it let me know it was definitely meant with malice. I was called the B-word by my teacher in high school when I was the only girl in my electronics class because I didn't know how to make a light bulb turn on using a wire and a battery. I was singled out by a previous manager, a white woman who criticized me for having confidence. She berated me. She demeaned that confidence and construed it as me thinking I was better than my peers. Essentially, black girl, know your place. I was told by many that I was too aggressive. I was intimidating. I don't have tact. I'm too direct. I make others feel uncomfortable because of who I am. And if I could just be a bit more soft, people would embrace me better. A narrative all too familiar for black women. I was told by a previous manager, a white man, that I wasn't able and needed to be, I wasn't, I wasn't needed, so he considered my request to get the same pay as my white peer, despite us being hired to do the same job, and both of us having the same level of education, he denied it. He said I wasn't necessary. I had to seek the support of a black manager to help me, who championed for me, and got me equity and six months back pay in that position. In previous roles, I've witnessed discrimination in the workplace and went to HR and was lectured, how do I know it's discrimination? People have the right to ask questions and be inquisitive about each other. Despite me explaining that, it was black staff being questioned by white staff about how they got hired and who did they know and what experiences do they have and what's their qualifications to do the job they got hired to do. Again, another narrative all too familiar for people of color. I've seen staff of color cry at the mistreatment of others. I've had people who identify as LGBTQ plead with me to advocate for them. I've had staff who are hard of hearing and from the deaf community cry to me and describe not being able to have fair access to resources that would get them on level playing fields to be able to be seen as competitive contenders for promotions. So despite being super qualified, they were not considered for upward mobility opportunities. I've had clients tell me they don't want to work with me because I'm black and question, aren't there any white people who can help me? In previous roles, I've walked into client homes and been greeted by Confederate flags and swastikas and black caricature pictures and memorabilia all over the walls and in the homes where I was supposed to do work. I've waited as the only person in line for seating without success in an empty restaurant with a white hostess busting tables around me because she didn't want to seat me. I've had to sneak out of a restaurant's parking lot and speed off in my car to get away from mobs of Klansmen. I've been jeered at by white men wearing Make America Great Again hats yelling at me and my husband, Trump for president, as a means to intimidate us. I had a white man yell at me and my one-year-old son in his stroller and call us the N-word and verbally assault us while we tried to get on an elevator, so much so that bystanders had to intervene to make sure we were safe. But I had a mother figure tell me once when she saw I was straightening my hair to look more professional, girl, don't you do that. You be you. You wear yourself and your hair proudly. Don't you ever feel like you need to change you for them. These things stick with me. I see what inequity looks like. I see what racism looks like. I know what it feels like, and I don't want young girls to buy into the narratives that it took me years to unlearn. This isn't just work for me, this is life. It's my sanity, I never get to turn it off. As a person of color, I don't have the luxury of choosing when I do or don't get to lead with my race. For me, equity is not a project or a checkbox. It's my life, it's my children's life, it's the future for everybody who looks like me and for everybody who is identified in a marginalized group who experiences dis dis stigmatization, discrimination, and marginalization. The work I do on behalf of young girls of color is to help them because of the experiences I've had. Young African American girls are attacked with so many negative messages. They talk too loud. Their hair is too kinky. Braids are not fit for the workplace. Their bodies are not professional. They need to hide their curves. You know, I googled beautiful women, and when I did, women of color images weren't there. I googled women in prison, and women of color images were everywhere. Mm -hmm. 
And these are the images and messages our girls see. We're told we aren't smart. We have glass ceilings that prevent us from going only so far. We're fit for prisons and remedial labor. So why wouldn't I want to introduce them to Justice Adrian Nelson, the first black female justice in the Oregon Supreme Court? Or Chief Daniel Outlaw, the first black female chief of the Portland police. Or retired Senator, yes, Margaret Carter, the first African-American woman elected to the Oregon Legislative Assembly. Or Commissioner Loretta Smith, the second African-American ever to serve on the Multnomah County Commission. Or, or Dr. Joy DeGruy, nationally and internationally renowned researcher, educator, and author who introduced us to the concept of post-traumatic slave syndrome who in 2015 consulted with Oprah Winfrey on one of her projects, or Leslie Goodlow Baldwin, the first female black president of the Portland Rose Festival, <laughs> and many more black women right here in Oregon who are firsts and who are leaders. So yes, as much as I have a passion for this work and believe this work is so necessary and required, I also have selfish motives. I need every young girl every young girl of color to recognize they are amazing, they are powerful, they are important, they matter, they contribute, they have value, they have purpose, they are incredible, they are beautiful just as they are, they don't have to dim their shine, they are not intimidating, they are not aggressive, they are, they are professional, they have promise, they have purpose, they are fearfully and wonderfully made, and they have a future. My goal is to use this platform to remind us all that equity is an entitlement to everybody. We all need to be change agents. We all need to be equity champions. We all need to find a space within equity to rile us up and get us selfish and get us angered up to stand against oppression, to look racism in the face and crush it, and to recognize that the practice of discrimination, inequity, and racism hurts everybody. And, and this, thank you. Initially, we may individually benefit from it, but collectively, we all suffer. It's like what Dr. Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much.